This episode was recorded in August 2022, and I hope you enjoy it. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by my mum, and we're going to spend the episode chatting about this and that and responding to some questions from Lepsters on Twitter. Uh, I hope you enjoy the episode, everyone. Stick with us. And as usual, you will find that the more you listen, the better it is for your English. Hopefully, we'll make that a little bit easier with this new episode. So, hi, Mum. Hello, Luke. How are you today? I'm all right. Thank you. How are you? Very well, thanks. Good. Shall we set the scene? Where are we? We're in our garden, my garden, Rick's and my garden, which is looking very, very sad. I was just complaining before you started the podcast at how terrible it looks because of the drought we've had in England this summer. It's it's not quite as bad as the picture <laughs> you're painting. Actually, it's lovely. It's very green. Well, it's not as green as it should be. There's lots of brown bits in it. True. And some of the plants have died. Um, if you'd seen it in May and June, it was absolutely gorgeous. It was full of roses and uh, bulbs and tulips and all sorts of lovely things. And now it's just looking rather sad. We've got a few more, a few roses which have um, reflowered, mm-hmm. but nowhere near as many as as we have in the middle of the season. And we've got a lot of flowers called Japanese anemones, which are very pretty and very. Um, Strong. They always come up every year at this time and add a bit of cheer to a rather dreary garden. It's not dreary at all. <laughs> Is that modesty? Is that English No, it's not. I'm modesty. just comparing with it with it at its peak when it's looking at its best. So, yes, we are recording this outside, listeners. Um, and um, the weather is is pretty good. It's um, in in the twenties, somewhere in the early twenties, like twenty three degrees or something like that. And um, there's blue sky. There is cloud up there as well. There's a little threat of rain in the distance with some grey cloud and a bit of wind, a bit of a breeze. I don't know if you'll be able to hear the wind. I don't think it's strong enough for that. It's quite a nice, gentleish sort of breeze, just enough to to. Um Dry the washing, which we've got hanging on the line. Yeah, um, but as the wind comes in, it might blow across our microphones. Yes, I suppose it might. So you might get a bit of this. <laughs> Don't know, you can't really hear it. It should be okay. My microphones should be protected from mm. that kind of thing. But uh, there you go. And also, listeners, you might hear some background noise. I don't know if these microphones will pick up all the background noise because they're designed only to record uh, the noise that's coming directly in front from in front of them if that makes sense. Uh, but you might hear sounds of um, things like, well, what, the, the church bells? You might hear them at some point. Uh, we will see. So that's all just atmospheric context. Now, Mum, it's been ages since you've been on the podcast uh, with your own episode. Mm. Um, the last time it was just you was April 2021, last really? year. Really? Gosh. Yeah, episode 717 which was Jill's book club when we talked about 1234 by Craig Brown. Oh, yes. Um, now, we we were doing Jill's book club, or we kind of used to do Jill's book club. Well, we've, we've done it twice, I think. No, we did three of those. Did we? Plus, we did another episode about quintessentially British books, which was the sort ah, of yes. the first one. Yeah. Uh, so we've done about four episodes of Jill's book club. Mm-hmm. And every now and then we talk about doing another one, but we have found it a bit tricky to choose books that Mm. most other people have probably read, that I've read too, that would appeal to enough people and that we can actually remember. Absolutely. And I'm having a bit of trouble reading at the moment because during lockdown, I couldn't read at all for ages. I found it really difficult to concentrate. Uh, And I started reading non-fiction books and memoirs and things like that, which are probably less easy to talk about than novels. And I haven't really read many novels at all since for the last three years, which is most peculiar, not not like me at all. So I would find it difficult to know what book to choose. Yeah, so 
I would say maybe in lieu of an episode of Jill's Book Club, we are just doing this, which is as yet untitled, this episode. <laughs> it might just be something like a chat about this and that, or it might be Q&A with mum in the garden or something like that. I don't know. But in any case, it's nice to have you on the podcast again. Mm. I'm still in introduction mode here. Uh, my aim for this episode is mainly to let people just listen to your voice, Mum, oh. and also listen to your words. Mm -hmm. And it sort of doesn't matter too much what we talk about, Good. as long as we just let the conversation flow and let the English happen naturally. We decided this time not to limit ourselves to any one specific topic here, preferring instead to cast our net quite wide in terms of things to talk about. But then yesterday evening, when we finally decided to do this, we kind of said, right, we're going to do it. Then I thought, oh God, right, well, I better come up with something. <laughs> so I, I went on Twitter and I tweeted this. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this. I saw that tweet. Yes, I haven't seen any answers to it. I haven't had a look at Twitter okay, so properly this morning. No, you haven't. Normally you're, on, you're quite active on Twitter, <laughs> yeah. but you haven't had a chance today. So I wrote this on Twitter yesterday evening. Very late notice, but I'm going to record a podcast with my mum tomorrow morning. Any questions for her? And I got about 26 replies. Gosh. So I have a selection of questions from listeners on Twitter, which we can explore. And that's probably a good starting point for recording a conversation with you, Mum. Okay. Fine. Ready for that? I think so. Okay. So I've kind of vaguely collated the questions into sections. The first section is... Uh, as you might expect, about book recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Let me just read through the tweets that mentioned books. Okay. So we got one from Christina, and it said this, not a very original one, but a classic. What books or book <laughs> did she enjoy recently? I'm looking forward to listening to you two. It's always such a treat. Please give your mum my best. And oh. as always, thanks for the podcast. Oh. So there you go. I'm giving you Christina's best. That's there you nice. Are. Thank you. Another one from Aritz. He said, yes, any book recommendations? <laughs> I read The Five and A Month in the Country. Oh, good. Thanks. I hope he enjoyed them. Cam wrote this. Could you please recommend us some books? And what do you think about Harry Potter? Ah. Let's continue with the, with the, with the tweets before you respond. Mm. Um, Benjamino, Benjamino Bianco um, wrote this. Yes, what book dedicated to Winston Churchill can you recommend? Uh, um. Thanks from Ilario. And also uh, another one, Enquête de Culture uh, wrote this. So happy to hear from your mother. I would like to know what she is currently reading, of course, and if she thought you would become a journalist like your father. When I listened to the Rick reports, I realised that journalism is not so far from your podcast. Many thanks. Let's go through those one by one. So it's more or less the same question each time. So have, what, what book or books have you enjoyed recently? Anything in particular or have you got nothing in mind? Ah, oh, it's awful. Whenever ever, anyone asks me that, I can never remember. I have recently read a book which was recommended to me by James, mm -hmm. um, which was called Car Park Life. Ah, Park uh, Life. Yes. Not Park it's Life not by Park Rick Thompson. Life. It's Car Park Life. Okay. And it's a rather strange, rather quirky, rather unusual sort of book, as you might imagine, from coming from James's recommendation. Mm -hmm. But he and I often enjoy it similar sorts of books and it's a bit uh, it's not very well known and it sounds strange and it probably is but it's about this guy who is interested in car parks and the things that happen in them how they're a sort of um unrecognized space in towns or countryside it's very hard to explain it it's not just about people parking cars and putting shopping no, it in isn't it's, it's about strange things that happen in car parks and you're going to want some examples and i can't think of any i'd have to go and get the book surely one of those examples is skateboarding oh yes of course yeah it's a lot of car parks are used for skateboarding they're also used for rather silly young men driving very quickly in their cars around car parks a lot of that happens at, at times you know in the evenings when the car parks are empty um, I've done both of those things, I have to say. You've driven quickly, very fast around a car park? Once upon a time, when I'd recently passed my driving licence, and I used to drive, I'm admitting something here to you, you I used are. to drive Dad's car around the area, just basically enjoying my freedom. <laughs> um, and once it was winter in a nearby town, and I was in a car park, the car park was completely empty, and it was 
a bit icy. Oh, God. So I did a little handbrake turn in the oh, car park. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> uh, it was under control conditions. Of course it was uh, not. <laughs> there weren't other cars and there was no one else there. Oh. And I executed quite a good 180 degree turn well, in the car. I'm glad I didn't know about and, it at the time. And then I carried on with my normal sensible life. Okay. Um, but So there you go. Maybe mm. It's a young man thing, isn't it? I wouldn't do that yes, these days. I should hope not. Apparently, you know, that they say that young men have like a sort of chemical in their brain that makes them take risks well yeah i don't know what it is but it's always been the case mm. um yeah and young other, yeah go on. young men have always been res- irresponsible and a pain in the neck a lot of the time <laughs> yeah yeah but you know they're just sort of chemicals are telling them to do it you know mm. oh, yeah it's a good excuse isn't it yeah yeah um and also in terms of skateboarding in car parks of course james and i used to go and skate mm. in the in the local pub car park. Yes. Which was also unused most yes, of the time. Yes, a nice big space as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's Car Park Life. Do you remember who it was by? You don't no, remember? I can find out. I can go and find it. But don't, don't worry. Okay. You don't have to get up. I'll, mm. I'll, I'll find out and maybe add uh, that in later. Yeah. So here I am, listeners, to tell you the name of the author of this book. So Car Park Life is by Gareth E. Rees. That's Gareth, G-A-R-E-T-H-E dot Rees, Rees spelled R-E-E-S. I'm assuming it's pronounced Rees or maybe Rees. Anyway, Gareth E. Rees or Gareth E. Rees. Car Park Life. The description of the book is this. Car Park Life is a psychogeographic exploration of the UK's retail chain store car parks by the author of Marshland and the Stone Tide. These commonplace urban landscapes are little explored, rarely featured in art and music, yet shape the aesthetics of our towns and cities. They are hotspots for crime, rage and sexual deviancy, a blind spot in which activities go unnoticed. Skateboarding, car stunts, drug dealing, dogging, murder. Gareth E. Rees journeys across the country from Plymouth to Edinburgh, Walking purposelessly, yes, that is a word, purposelessly, meaning without a purpose. Uh, <laughs> the opposite of that is purposeful, purposefully, but this is purposelessly. Yeah. So Gareth E. Rees journeys across the country from Plymouth to Edinburgh, walking purposelessly through car parks, taking notes, much to the horror of his family, friends, and most of all, himself. In this darkly satirical work of non-fiction, Gareth E. Rees presents a troubling vision of Brexit Britain through a common space we know less about than we think. That's Car Park Life, available from Influx Press, from any good bookshop. There you go. Back to the episode. Cam said, what do you think of Harry Potter? Well, I can't tell you because I've never read any. Uh, mm-hmm. It doesn't appeal to me at all. Why not? Um, well, because it's a children's book. <laughs> <laughs> and, You've um, never read any children's books? Well, of course, I've read loads of children's books when I was a child. And from what I can gather, um, J.K. Rowling has been very clever and used a sort of... Um, narratives and storylines and premises themes and themes from a whole variety of children's books and put them all into one also i'm not keen on things like wizards and magic and that kind of thing so no i haven't been at all interested and don't wish to be interested in harry potter i'm afraid whole swathes of the international community are now... And switching off. Well, hopefully not switching off, but they're just disappointed. They're yeah. gutted now. They're thinking, oh, goodness me, what is she like? But then there are plenty of other people who are, who are cheering yes. right now, going, yeah, someone who hasn't read Harry Potter. <laughs> um, so there you go, listeners. If you wanted Harry Potter conversation... I'm sorry, you're disappointed. Come to the wrong place here. Mm. But we won't We won't now trash Harry Potter or anything. I've read, I've read all of them. Yeah. Well, I think for, for some children... Well, for children, for modern children, they must be brilliant because they have no mem- no knowledge or memory of the books that are sort of 
used as examples or whose plots are used in Harry Potter. They've got no memories of any of those other books and so they can enjoy it just for what it is and I'm sure it's brilliant. Particularly, I gather, for boys because boys are notoriously difficult to... You know, girls very often are book what we call bookworms. They tend to get very keen on reading and they enjoy, like I was when I was a kid, I just used to read all the time. And uh, but boys tend, I mean, it's a generalization, but boys tend not to do that uh, and they find it difficult to get into reading. Um, I think you did, didn't you? Didn't Probably, it take yeah. you a long time to start realizing yeah. that reading was a good thing? I think so. Uh, whereas I think James took to reading much quicker than you did, anyway. Um, uh, yes, but apparently Harry Potter books are very good for, for young boys who can't get interested in anything else. Uh, apparently they, they get very wrapped up in Harry Potter and read a lot of the books, which is good. If it gets kids into reading, it's good. When you get into them, they are quite riveting. They do become yeah. quite riveting and and uh, certainly the later books are very long i know uh, i've sold lots of them in the shop and i know how long how big the books are and we know that one of the satisfying things about reading is finishing a book yes it does give you a great sense of uh, accomplishment it's a weird feeling finishing a book particularly a book that you've enjoyed so much and you've sort of lived in the book for all the time you've been reading it then it suddenly comes to an end you feel quite bereft and a bit sort of you don't quite know what to do with yourself for a few hours that's my experience anyway. Mm, mm. Um, so on that point, Harry Potter is good for kids in the sense that it makes them read a lot. I'm sure it's brilliant because she obviously has the knack of writing stories that that grab you and that children just want to keep reading because they're so exciting or interesting. I, or I particularly remember the fifth book. Very, yeah. very long and not a great deal. I feel there's a lot of fill filler Ah. in there but it's filler that you read through at incredible speed i mean i I read that book so fast which one's that the order of the phoenix i think it's called yeah um and there's a lot of stuff about a journalist going around writing nasty pieces about people and harry possibly uh having a romantic involvement with another girl at school and then someone dies and that's kind of the the, 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 the story and spoiler no spoilers here by the way um (laughs) the sad books are good a lot of books have sad endings i was um you probably remember i mentioned it on our whatsapp group about raymond briggs Yes. Who wrote a lot of our favourite books like Father Christmas and The Snowman and Fungus the Bogeyman. These are kids' books and they are, they kind, are. Of, kind of comic books. but Well, they're written in comic book style, but most of them are really sad and they usually have sad endings. You know, like the snowman dies, and actually, Father Christmas is okay. He doesn't have a sad ending. He's but, got a very uh, nice, cosy ending. That yes, one. he has. But uh, I just love his Father Christmas because he's so grumpy. Me too. And so cross. It's one of my favourite books to read to uh, my daughter. Yes. Is uh, Father Christmas, and yeah. I'm always happy to pull that one off the shelf because I enjoy reading it, yeah. and um, I enjoy the images. It's basically this the uh, the summary of Father Christmas by Raymond Briggs, who, as you say, died um, just. Uh, recently yeah um this is you know it's a very nicely illustrated uh, comic book for children where we see what father christmas does on the night of christmas eve and it's the one day in the year when he has to go and do his duties and fly and as off. raymond briggs himself said well you would be grumpy can you imagine it's a horrible job yeah. you're out in the cold up in the sky in the wind and the rain and the snow and you have to land on roofs and go down horrible dirty chimneys and, and try and find your way to the yeah. to the christmas tree or find try and na- negotiate your way through all the different houses and and some of the houses don't have chimneys and he <laughs> he, he scratches his head and goes how am i going to get in here and um, <laughs> He's, he, he drinks brandy wherever he goes, yeah, so and by the time he's finished, he's exhausted and he's falling asleep on his sleigh as he flies yeah. home in the, in the, as the sun comes up. Yeah, and he's all tired and he gets in and feeds his cat and dog and and you just watch his routine, mm. which is him kind of you know he comes in has a has a bath and then mm. he he cooks himself a dinner. It's quite sad as well because he's on his own. That's true. Yeah. He has yeah. Christmas dinner on his own. Yes, he does. Opens Every, yeah. presents on his own. Yeah. But a lot of, you know, a lot of people are on their own at Christmas. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's very subtly quite a touching, it is. Uh, sweet book. And, and, mm. and of course, there's the snowman, which is famous. Yeah. Um, okay. Where were we there? Um, Children's, uh, Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. <laughs> yeah. 
So there you go. All right. So you haven't read it. What about Winston Churchill? That was uh, Benjamino Bianco, who mm. was curious about a book dedicated to Winston Churchill. Oh, a bit of politics, listeners. Mm, I'm afraid I can't help you either because I'm not a fan of Winston Churchill. Really? No. But I, I mean, thought he was the greatest uh, Englishman that ever existed well, and so on and a hero no. and all that. Well, he is to some people, but um, he's become a bit of an icon. On it. Some people are a bit... They, I don't know what the word is. They fetishise him. He he comes to represent lots of things about England that I don't like. Uh, people who are who always hark back to the war and say how brilliantly we did in the war and how you know Winston was a hero and well I'm sure he was the right man for the time. I mean he managed. He's a brilliant orator and he managed to. Um, and make fantastic speeches and stir people and get people to do the things that you have to do during war. But I'm not sure as a person, he wouldn't be my hero. Um, and I'm not interested in that kind of book, I'm afraid. I'm not interested in that kind of person or that kind of book. I'd much rather read about a you know, rather sad old man like Raymond Briggs <laughs> <laughs> than some bombastic man who... You know, men in red faced men in football shirts think he's wonderful. A guy who was, did was responsible for a lot of a lot of slaughter in the war. Yeah, and I mean, we weren't brilliant in the war. I won't go into all that. No, let's but, not uh, go into that. No, but, but I find it rather distressing and unpleasant, and I'm really not interested in him. I'm sorry. What was the listener's well, name? Well, uh, it was Benjamino. I'm yeah. sorry, Benjamino, but. Um, you can't come to me for recommendations about Winston Churchill. Although we do like to be useful on Luke's English podcast. So we do. I have, I did do a quick Google search, Good. Benjamino, which to be fair, Benjamino could have done too, but uh, mm. that's all right. It turned up an article on The Guardian. Let's have a quick look at that. Paul Addison's top 10 books on Winston Churchill. Paul Addison is director of the Centre for Second World War Studies at the University of Edinburgh. He is a former visiting fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, and the author of Churchill, The Unexpected Hero, recently published by Oxford University Press. There's 10 books. Uh, we're going to skip to item number 10 in the list, and I'll just read this to you. Okay, Benjamino. So this is, um, Paul Addison recommends two books here in, in, at the end of his list. Churchill by Roy Jenkins and Churchill, A Study in Greatness by Jeffrey Best. And these are Paul Addison's words. The competition for the title of best one volume life of Churchill is intense. And the result, it seems to me, is a tie between Roy Jenkins and Jeffrey Best. Both authors are comprehensive, accurate and stylish, but in different ways. Jenkins brings to the subject a veteran politician's feel for office and power, a worldly appreciation of Churchill's love of the good life and an encyclopedic appetite for detail. His account is richly descriptive, but tends to stick to the surface of events. Best is a more reflective and speculative writer with a historian's flair for the insights that lie just beyond the tangible evidence. By different routes, both authors come to the same conclusion, or as Best puts it, his achievements, taken all in all, justify his title to be known as the greatest Englishman of his age. In this later time, we are diminished if admitting Churchill's failings and failures, we can no longer appreciate his virtues and victories. So there you go. So Jeffrey Brest, on balance, comes on the other side of the the opinion to you, Mum, which yeah. is that we should, uh, you know, take it all into account. And on balance, he's more good than bad. Okay. But uh, you know, there we yeah. go. That's where we'll end that. Yeah. So were there any other things here? Yeah, enquête de culture asked for reading recommendations mm. and as well. Oh, by the way, I, I read the Hopkins manuscript. Oh, yes. Yes, we can talk about that S a Since bit. we're in the sort of Jill's Book Club zone here, <laughs> and this yes. is the, we're about to move on to something else. But um, So you recommended uh, the Hopkins manuscript by R.C. Sheriff. Who was the man who wrote... Um the fortnight. the fortnight in September, which I think I recommended you, on another you did. podcast. Uh, yes, I'd forgotten about that. Um, in fact, I think we gave it to you for your birthday about <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> it was about f maybe four or five years yeah. ago, yeah. And you've just managed to get around to reading it. And I think you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, good. I thought you might because it's an unusual, very unusual sort of science fiction book or? well as it says in the is it the afterword that the, yes. there's a the afterword 
being this little sort of chapter that comes at the end of a book sometimes. Well, it's usually another author or someone with an interest who gives their thoughts on the book, exactly. I think. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's, it's a bit like the foreword, yes. which is the same thing, like someone else writes a chapter before the book begins where they give a sort of commentary on the book. The afterword is what comes after the story. And yeah, as you say, is often mm. written by someone else. So the afterword was written by, I can't remember, but it was an expert on, um, um, on, on astrology. Astrology, right? An expert on ast- astrology is the astronomy. Right. Astronomy. I always get confused. I know I do too. Astrology is star signs. The zodiac, the signs of the zodiac, yeah, and, and astronomy. Astronomy is, is, is the planets. It's the proper yeah. science of yeah, studying so. the planets. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, an expert on astronomy uh, wrote the afterword, and uh, this expert, whose name I can't remember, unfortunately, yeah. commented that there are two types of science fiction book. There are ones that are more committed to the science right. and they start with the scientific yeah. premise and follow it through to its logical conclusion, yes. which is where they take, for example, the idea, what if there were intelligent species on another planet that yeah. decided to try and invade and how would that really work? Mm. You know, and with our scientific knowledge, you know, uh, sort of create a story based on those scientific principles. So something like um, maybe... Uh, Asimov, someone like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or no, whoever wrote 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm not Arthur an expert C, on Arthur the... C. Clarke. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's the more scientific side of science fiction. Mm. And then there's the more fiction side of science fiction, which is... Philip Dick, he's a one of those kinds of... Philip K. Dick. Yes, he was a chap who wrote the book... Do Androids, Androids Dream, Dream of, of Electric, Electric Sheep. Sheep, which is what was made into the film Blade Runner, I right? Think. Yeah. Uh, which was basically, you know, what would happen if we had synthetic people yeah. living with us, and yeah. what would be the ramifications on society, and so on. Uh, mm. So there's the the more scientific oriented ones. Obviously, some of them are, are a mix of the yeah, two. So the the spectrum is the more hard science on one end. Uh, which is something like maybe The Martian by um, Andy Weir, mm. which was made into a film with um, Ben Aff, not Ben Affleck, Matt Damon. Mm. So that's basically what if a guy gets trapped on Mars with limited technology around him, right. how would he survive? And he's a botanist. I mean, obviously, it's a lot of, he takes a lot of fictional liberties with it, but basically. It's lots of, here's a problem, and here's how we use engineering or physics or botany to solve that problem. Right. It's really good, actually. So there's the hard science on the one end of the spectrum, and the other end of the spectrum is more taking a scientific premise and then using that to tell a human story, focusing more on emotional things or uh, socio-political themes. Mm. And so the Hopkins manuscript by R.C. Sheriff is more of that kind of science fiction story. It was published in the 1930s. um, (sighs) Probably. Written after World War I, but before World War II in that period, that strange period, you know. What's it about? Do you remember? <laughs> it's Well, it's years since I read it, but I know that it's about this rather strange, rather pompous, rather boring little man who gets involved in a situation where he hears that the moon is going to crash into the earth. Actually, it's just occurred to me, it reminds me of that film that was on recently. What's it called? Don't Look Up. I haven't seen Don't Look ah, Up. It's a really good film. It's a sort of satire on um, the fact that people, the, the media don't listen to experts properly. Right. Basically. And they, it's a similar thing where a meteor is going to crash into the earth and they know it's true and they have the proof and they know when it's going to happen and they try and tell people and they won't listen to them. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the meteor crashes into the earth. Well, I think the Hopkins man in script is similar to that he finds out doesn't he through some means he's a member of the the club lunar society yes that's right which is this i mean it's all written obviously um you know it's it's a picture of society in the 1920s and 1930s and so he's a member of this rather upper class exclusive gentleman's club Mm. uh, of scientists and uh, yeah, because he's a member of the Lunar Society, he is informed by the president of the society at a big meeting that they've discovered by uh, observing the moon that it has been knocked off its path and is heading towards Earth at an exponential rate. And they're told that, you know, they're given the news 
that basically the earth, the moon will probably crash into the earth or maybe glance off yeah, it. Yeah, so not quite sure. Ricochet off it. Yeah. Or, or they're not sure, but it's definitely going to hit the earth in some respect. And then... Yeah, so with this information, we and through the 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 uh, accounts. But isn't of, it true that mm. they are t- members of the society are told not to tell anyone? Yeah, because it would cause panic. Yeah, yeah. This context is used to comment on society. Yeah, and you see the ways in which people respond to the information, and the ways that society responds with this situation, and. Um, Yes, yeah, socio-political it is. commentary, and it's very interesting about the the, the man himself. I can't remember his name, but Hopkins, when, Edgar Hopkins. Oh, of course. Yeah, and when and when of course the, the moon does crash into the Earth or or gets close to it, and everything starts to change, and society begins to break down. It's very interesting seeing the way he copes with it all and how he becomes a different sort of person. Almost, he takes. Yeah. A lot of responsibility and control, doesn't he? Yeah, there's the there's the character arc. Yeah, his his character plot line and the way yes. he develops as a person, and there's the scientific plot line of mm. how the moon hits the Earth and what happens as a result, uh, which was the part that I found a little bit hard to. Yes, of course. I mean, it's entirely fanciful, but it's just a, a device, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. So that's the, the science there was quite soft. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. But then there's the, uh, the uh, storyline of, of society and how mm. that changes and develops and stuff. And, mm. and um, I won't, we won't talk more no, about it, no. but it's, it's a very interesting book and I found it very readable. Oh, yes. Good. And so I do recommend it. Yeah. That's the Hopkins manuscript. The way it begins is that you get an introduction uh, explaining that this is a manuscript that's been discovered. So there's the bit the the book starts way into the future after the the event the main events of the book have all happened mm. and and so on. So it's way into the future, and essentially the 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 manuscript which is written by Hopkins himself yeah. as a. Uh, yes. Just at the end of the story, he writes the entire thing out and writes his story. Yeah. Uh, this manuscript has been discovered in the sort of broken remains of a building. Mm. And it's presented as a historical artifact. Mm. And the only remaining historical evidence of society of, of that time. So mm. it presents it like that. And it's quite a bleak beginning mm. where you learn that the world is completely different because of various things that you don't really know about but it's sort of alluded to um, an environmental collapse Mm. and a huge new political and social order that has come about as a result and uh, Britain is kind of deserted Mm. essentially but people have been going in there like uh, uh, groups of scientists and um, archaeologists have gone in there to find bits of evidence and one of the things they found is this manuscript mm. and then you read the manuscript and it tells the whole story yeah uh, it was sad it's mm. it's yeah it's a sad story it certainly is but it's not sad in that he kind of finds himself doesn't he 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 develops as a person through his experiences yeah yeah, um, yeah. i think that somehow the experience the the tragedy that happens is weirdly two-sided. Obviously, mm. it's a tragedy, but for him personally, it does bring him out of himself yeah. and he learns and grows as a person. And he makes worthwhile relationships through it, doesn't he? Mm. Which he didn't have before. Yeah. And, you know, it's a philosophical point, you know, yeah. is, if, is it worth it? Is, it? is a life worth living if it's not lived to its fullest, you know, extent? Yeah. And so maybe it's a happy story in that regard, mm. in that his, his life somehow... Has, is more fulfilled than it would have been. Mm. Anyway, there you go. So I want to c- come back to Enquête de Culture on Twitter here. Mm. And we'll, we'll sort of move to... A lot of questions asked you about your relationship with me, obviously, because I'm so <laughs> such, a, such an important, integral part of... Which is of, there to say about that? <laughs> um, but one of the questions is, did you, did you ever think that I would become a journalist like Dad? Because obviously my dad, your husband... Mm-hmm the famous Rick Thompson um, was a journalist f- and still is. Um, um, but did you ever think I'd become a journalist? What, did you ever th- imagine what I would grow up to become? Well, all parents wonder that about their children. I didn't really know, had no idea, but th- there was a point after you'd finished university when you did consider doing uh, journalism, I think, an MA in journalism or something like that at Birmingham University. Didn't you go for an interview? 
Can't remember. Gosh, anyway. yeah, I don't remember that a small episode in my life there. Yeah, uh, yeah there was a vague sense I was going to go into the media. Yeah, you I, did think about it, I yeah, think. I did I did some work experience at production companies. Yes. And I also went and talked to Yeah, I did. I went to talk to someone who was doing an MA That's in journalism. Yeah. She she um it was Diane, Diane Kemp. Yeah. It was Diane Kemp who used yeah. to read the news. Yeah. And um I talked to her and she asked me to read out some some uh, scripts. Oh, did she? And I didn't read them like this. <laughs> I think if I'd read them like this, I would have got the place um, on the university course. God. But I sort of read them probably slightly unconfidently and... Hesitantly. We both agreed it wasn't really what I mm. wanted wanted to do. Mm. I never knew what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. So the answer to the question is, I suppose it had crossed my mind that you might, but I certainly didn't think... In positive, I didn't definitely think I was the same as you. I had no idea what you'd do. Yeah. So, but I think Enquête de Culture, uh, whose real name may be Emma, because the handle on Twitter is Emma B two nine four four. Right. Um, so uh, I think you're right that journalism is not far from podcasting. It's yeah. broadcasting, really. Mm. Broadcasting is the thing. Very broadcasting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what my dad did it's, as much as it, him being a journalist he was a broadcaster yeah uh, anyway james harris wrote this no questions but please compliment your mum on raising a fine boy <laughs> that's nice no james, that's very nice of james thank you james james is actually very a uh, really nice guy he's a comedian he's a writer yeah he, he was a guest on this podcast once huh. uh, but that's a sincere uh, comment from james well thank, thank you, james. you james i'm glad you um like my boy Cam, again, wrote this. How does it feel to give birth to a famous podcaster? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, giving birth to him felt horrible. <laughs> it was very painful. Very painful. Um... <laughs> and plus in 1977, <laughs> podcasts didn't exist. So it's like, oh, this is painful. Don't worry, Mrs. T Mrs. Thompson. He's going to become a famous podcaster. Push! <laughs> A what? <laughs> so, I don't know the answer to that, really. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, how does it feel to have a famous podcaster? It feels your... great, and I'm very, very glad That's and nice. very happy That's nice. that he is. Uh, okay. Um, Romario said, how does it feel to know that people from many parts of the world know a little bit about your relationship with your son? <laughs> very peculiar. Very odd. I have to say that it's. I'm very happy that Luke has brought so many disparate people from all parts of the world. That's disparate, to, listeners. Not, di not desperate. Disparate, which means lots of different types of people. Spread out in different places. Disparate, not desperate. You are not desperate. Unless you are desperate. I need to learn English help! And maybe you are desperate, but also... As I was saying, yeah. lots of disparate people from all over the world who have one thing in common in that they listen to Luke's English podcast. And I remember <clears throat> when you got married... Seven years ago, yeah. some of your listeners made a really wonderful little film yep. um, wishing you the best and sending you congratulations, which we played at the wedding. And it was absolutely lovely. It was tear jerking. I felt so um, moved. Yeah. Yeah. That all these people from all over the world, you know, it was like, I think one of the people said, you know, it's a peaceful, happy mixture of people from all sorts of walks of life and all sorts of different parts of the world. And I think that's something to be very proud of. Lepland. That's, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's the spirit of Lepland. Lepland is a great place. Yeah, that's right. It's a good place. Okay. So, yeah, I have to thank Guillaume from Switzerland for um, doing that video and everyone else who took part. Yeah. Very, very nice. It was indeed. wonderful. Yeah, very, very touching. Yeah, you know, it was amazing. You you kept it secret. You yes. and James and Dad. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, in the middle of the party, like, can you can we just steal you for for ten <laughs> minutes? And I'm like, what? What's this? We've got something to show you, huh? And then you showed me the video, and I was yeah. like, wow, this is wow, this is amazing. It was. Um, Cam again wrote this. Why did you name your son Luke? Why not Dave? <laughs> yes, yeah, very interesting question, really. Um, well, as you, oh, I don't know if you're a parent, but. Um, well, when, you're am, but... when you're expecting a child, you spend a lot of time trying to decide what to call them. Um, I mean, an R ring and having disagreements and choosing one thing and then saying no, 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 and choosing something else. <laughs> and I'm really not sure how it happened. I think it was a mixture of the fact that I loved the film Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. 
<laughs> one of my favourite films. Yeah. And also that my favourite ancestor, my great grandfather on my father's side, my father's grandfather, he was called Luke. And he's, my, as I say, he's my favourite of all my ancestors because he was such a... Well, I never knew him, but all that I know about him uh, makes me feel that he was an extraordinary person and a very likeable, bit of a rogue, my father said oh, yeah? he was. What does that mean? It means that he was not conventional, didn't do the normal thing, was a bit of a risk taker. A, ma- a maverick? A maverick. Like, yeah. yeah, that's one word for him. Okay. Um, and I always liked him and... I'm sorry that I never knew him, and I don't even have a photograph of him, which really annoys me, because I'd love to know what he looked like. Anyway, <clears throat> that was another reason why we chose the name Luke. He was a successful breeder of dogs, among many he other was, things. yes. He used to breed hounds for the hunt. Yeah, he, he was yeah. an award-winning dog mm-hmm. breeder, and yeah. also lots of other things. He had a particular yeah. set of skills, I understand. Well, he didn't... He, you know, he wasn't qualified, he wasn't educated. He started out at the age of 16, I think, as a a blacksmith. Someone who... Someone who puts shoes on horses. Um, And I'm not sure all the steps he went to, but he ended up being the landlord of a pub. And it got, it became so successful that he bought, this pub was run by a certain brewery and he was just the landlord. He was employed by the brewery to run the pub. And he did it so well that in the end he bought the pub from the brewery. So he owned the pub himself and made a lot of money at it. And then apparently, eventually, he sold it back to the brewery at an increased price. And with the money, he built a terrace of houses in a place called Sowerby Bridge. Which is which part of the country? Which is in the West Riding, not far from Halifax. Yorkshire, ladies and gentlemen. In Yorkshire. Gentlemen. Yeah. And I, we went and we took my dad to, um, well, my dad knew about it, but we went with my dad to the row of houses some years ago uh, just to visit it because I'd never been and just to sort of pay tribute. And he, uh, Luke lived in one of the houses and his daughter, my father's aunt, lived in the house next door. And when we went to visit this row of houses, we were outside looking at them, and the man came out of what had been my aunt's house and said, "Um, can I help you? He was obviously wondering what we were doing, staring at his house, so he explained why we were there. And he said, oh, do you want to come in? For a cup of tea. Well, we didn't have a cup of tea, but we went in, and um, of course it must have looked very different from when my father used to go there as a child. Yeah. But he stood there and said, oh, that's where I used to sit playing with my Meccano set, and that's where this was and that was. So, um, yeah, anyway, that was that was Luke. Can and I ask what, what sort of period of time Luke was doing these things? Oh, God. Well, it was at the end of the 19th century. I'm afraid I can't so tell you the exact date. Late 1800s, yes, 1890, 1880-something. Yeah. Yes. That sort of period, Victorian yeah. times or Edwardian <sighs> times? When Vic- did- Victorian going into, I mean, Victoria late reigned of- until 1911, I think. Okay. Um, so it was Victorian, Edwardian era. Okay. Um, my father was born in 1920, but Luke had died by then. Mm-hmm. Luke died quite young, really, at the age of 69. Okay. So Dad never knew him either. Right. Ah. So, yeah. Well, it feels nice to have been named after someone yeah. with such an interesting story. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was about... Uh, uh, okay, tangent time. <clears throat> Is this, a, is this an appropriate thing to ask you, that you and Dad both had DNA tests done? Yes, we did. So, yeah. listeners, a DNA test. Well, you know more. How, what well, is a DNA it's test? it's just something that, that um, well, now we know about DNA. You know, some years ago, I don't know how long ago, it, someone discovered it or worked out how to do it, where you can um, examine the genes and the chromosomes i don't know i'm 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 not scientific but you what you do is you spit into a tube so you send a a, a tube of your spit off to these people and uh, because they use it in crime detection of course these days to identify culprits of various things but some uh, very resourceful firm has suddenly thought hang on we can make money out of this if we charge people to do a dna test on them which tells them where they came from, where their parents came from, for example, mainly uh, the genetic makeup Ancestry. of your parents. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, so Rick had one done and and then he bought one for my birthday. So I recently had mine done. And it was really not a surprise what we found out that I think, well, we both had similar results in that most of our DNA was North English from north north of England, specifically Yorkshire. Oh, well, that the, was the clock. That was the clock striking don't know if you one, heard o- it. one o'clock there. Just the church clock. Yeah. Obviously, they don't know your parents and they don't know who your parents were and they can't do a DNA test on your parents, but they can tell you about both sides of your genetic makeup. So they've got parent one and parent two. And one of my parents is entirely Yorkshire, apart from a little bit of Scottish. Mm-hmm. And my other parent is almost entirely Yorkshire with a little bit of Irish and a little bit of Scottish and some um, Scandinavian. Right. So one of the Vikings that came over. I think what it says, I can't remember now, I think what it says is Northern Europe is what my main makeup is. Northern Europe, specifically Northern England. All I know is that they sent me a map. Yeah highlighting the various bits that were represented in my DNA. And there was a bit of um, Scandinavia, there was a bit of Scotland, uh, a lot of Northern Europe with Great Britain highlighted and within Great Britain, Yorkshire is highlighted and within Yorkshire, it's West Yorkshire and North East Yorkshire. Okay, so you're, you're East Yorkshire. basically English, North of England. Yes, with a bit of Scandinavian and Scotland and Scottish. And Dad is the same thing, pretty yes, much. Yes, so there's a bit more Irish. There's a bit more Irish and Scottish in Rick's, I think. Yeah. As far as I can remember. Okay. Well, anyway, interesting. I thought the listeners might find yeah. that interesting. I yeah. might... Even th- though we're not very clear on how, <laughs> how no. it all works. No. Well, I'm, I, there's more to talk about there. That mm. could be another episode yeah. for another time. Yeah. Um, relationship to your granddaughter. Oh. Um, so, Teresa wrote this... Um, well, actually, uh, Teresa, I don't understand your question. Um, she said, yes, I have one, maybe too personal. Uh, so you couldn't maybe, you know, so basically you don't have to use yes, it. But yeah. She says this, how does she feel as a British nanny? Well, she's made a mistake there. Well, no, some people call grandmothers nanny. Yeah, nan. Yeah. Nan, nan, nan nanny, a, nana. Yeah. Nanny, nana, nan is a common yeah. word in England for grandmother. But yeah. we say granny. We say granny, yeah. How's it, well, how does it feel to be a British granny? I mean, it's, a, yes. it's an odd question, really. I suppose really. she means how does it feel being a British granny to a French granddaughter, or well, half French granddaughter. Not even half French. 100% French, 100% English. <laughs> now, this is, a, this is an important point for me, that my daughter is not half anything. Uh-huh. She's 100% French. And 100% English. Oh, okay. okay that's She's got two passports. Point. She doesn't have half a French oh, I passport see what you mean. and half an English right, passport. Right, she's right, She's got two right. passports. She's, yeah. two, she's 100% of both. But if she had a DNA test, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? That there'd, would be very interesting. There'd be a lot of European blood in her. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, sorry. <laughs> I forget that we're part of Europe. I don't know why. Continental European blood. Continental. It'd be a lot of continental European. I guess Southern European blood as well. Yes. Italian, um, French. Her mum has, uh, there's a lot of Italian in her family Mm. um, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Anyway, Uh, to go back to the question, it feels lovely. (laughs) Yeah. That's all I could say. I mean, she she's a charming little girl and I love having her around. And she's a real character. And I just love the way she can speak both English and French. Yeah. I think it's miraculous and very clever. Yeah. <laughs> Teresa says, any special food for... Well, again, she's made a mistake. <laughs> any special food for her niece as a British grandmother? It's not niece, it's granddaughter. Yeah, granddaughter. Not niece, granddaughter. Um, any special food? What, what, do, what special food do you make for your granddaughter? <laughs> I don't think I make any special food. She's fantastic at eating. She eats anything. Yeah. She enjoys her food. She's a pleasure to feed. But there is one particular recipe that as, oh, a, as yes. a family, we, we yes. I mean, you're, you're a brilliant cook and um, all your food is great. But there's, but there's one thing that I'm famous for in our family, and that is Bakewell tart. Bakewell tart, or as my daughter says, Bakewell tart. Bakewell tart. So Bakewell tart um, is what? Yes, although I've failed this time. I haven't made any, you have I? didn't make any, but that's all right. I thought maybe you were possibly getting a bit sick of eating Bakewell tarts no, all the time. never. So I didn't make any, but next time you come, I'll make some. Bakewell tarts is a little... We, you make small ones. Yes, individual, and individual it's, a, ones. it's a pastry case, 
and inside the pastry case you put a bit of jam and on top of the jam you put a, a frangy panny frangy pan mixture which is eggs, pan in sugar, French, yeah. Uh, and ground almonds. Eggs, sugar, ground almonds. Mm. And you also pop a, an almond on the oh, top. Oh, yes, and a little almond on the top. Do you, do you put a glaze on the top of no. the... No? Nope. You don't put an egg glaze or nope. a sugar glaze or anything? No. Nope. 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 So uh, pastry, a uh, bit of jam, uh, sugar, flour... Sh- no flour. No, sorry. Sugar, eggs... Oh, fat. Butter. Butter. Sugar, eggs, butter, and ground, ground almonds. Ground almonds and an almond on and the top. An almond on and the you top. bake it in the oven. Yeah. And they come out and they are flipping delicious, listeners. <laughs> uh, and I've had Bakewell tarts in various places from various sources, uh, and they've never, ever been as good oh. as the Bakewell tarts that you make, Mum. Oh. So, and uh, my wife. Your daughter-in-law is constantly saying that you should open a, a cafe <laughs> yeah. called Jill's Bakery and you would make lots of money in Paris yeah. selling your Bakewell tarts to the Parisians. Mm. Um, probably right, but who can, who's got the energy oh, for that? Well, I certainly haven't. Um, <laughs> well, you Actually, your wife would. She's got lots of energy. Yeah, she would, wouldn't she? Um, Gupsa says... Well, this this is a little bit of a personal question, uh, oh. Gupsa. You can you have the right to uh, remain silent. Yes. So, uh, so that she can see her grandchild more often, does she ever prefer that you, with your family, live in England? So, would you prefer ah, it if we all lived, lived in, in England? England? Well, to be perfectly honest, yes. <laughs> 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 of course, I would. I'd love it if they lived around the corner and I could pop round and see them any time as quite a lot of my friends are in that position they have their grandchildren and their family very close to them and yeah I would love it but you know that's not the way the world works that's he works in Paris he fell in love with a Parisian girl and that's the way it is yeah, yeah. but um yes I would love it if they were over here okay well sorry <laughs> <laughs> um uh, Eddie, Eddie. Edia, Edie Rosa said, I use both English and Portuguese when talking to my niece. Mm. Um, I speak Portuguese. She answers in English and vice versa. Uh-huh. I wonder if Jill fears not being able to have a fluent, comprehensible conversation with her granddaughter in the future. Are you, are you scared that you might not be able to have a, a, um, you know, a comprehensible, coherent yeah. conversation with yeah. your granddaughter? And according to Edie... That was my main motivation to study English. Right. So are you ever worried that you won't be able to have a a coherent conversation with your granddaughter in the future? No, I'm not. Not because I speak French, because I don't. My French is terrible. But her English is so brilliant that I'm sure I'll be able to have conversations, very good conversations with her. I mean, I do already. And she's only little. And when she's older, it'll be even better. Yep. OK. So uh, moving on to cooking. A few questions about cooking, if you don't mind. Mm. So we can answer these fairly quickly because we've already talked about Bakewell tarts. Uh, Jay says, how is her cooking? What is her signature dish? (laughs) Any secret family recipes? Well, I mean, you know, you've 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 already had it, Jay. Bakewell tarts, the Jill Thompson way. I suppose that's my signature dish. You've got lots of signature dishes, Mum. Uh-uh. You did a whole cookbook for James, me and Dad uh, yeah. to encourage us to cook more. I think I'm the only one who uses it. Yes, probably. It contains some of your mm. recipes. Well, they're not my recipes. They're things I cook most often, which are, you know, the things that everybody cooks. Easy to cook yeah, stuff. Yeah, easy to cook stuff. Uh Jay, if, you, if you're interested, I did an episode of the podcast uh, a few years ago in which I t- uh, cooked one of those recipes. Did you? Yeah. Uh, cooking with Luke. Hold on. Let me put my microphone down. Uh, hold on. Well, th- first of all, there's episode 413, which is when we were uh, here at Christmas time. And there's a bit of conversation with us about how to cook a delicious turkey dinner oh. at Christmas time. And there's you and me <coughs> and Nick. And... Uh, we talk about how to cook, how to make sure that the turkey is moist. <laughs> um, we probably use the word moist a bit too much. Uh, and then episode 328 is called Cooking with Luke, Verbs and Expressions in the Kitchen. And in that episode, I teach you verbs and expressions for cooking while preparing a delicious chicken dinner in the kitchen using one of your recipes. The lemon and garlic one. Lemon and garlic, the classic mm. lemon and garlic chicken. So you could check that one out too uh, if you want to, Jay. Uh, moving on to this one from uh, a name 
that I don't know because it's written in Cyrillic, uh, but I can tra I can translate it. Just give me a second. So this is from da -da -da -da, Dennis. Ah, oh, it's my uh, father's name. It's your father's name, uh, Dennis, uh, written, writing in Cyrillic. Uh, oh, gosh. Okay, feel, this is not in the cooking section. Uh, I don't know what this is doing here. Um, I'm going to come back to that one. Okay, I'll come back to that. Um, right, another one from Jay is this. Is it true that English people in general are not good cooks? Ooh. He goes on. Gordon Ramsay is a great chef, but he usually cooks Asian food. <laughs> uh, his restaurant in London is Asian restaurant. And, well, I have, to, I have to correct you on that one, Jay. Gordon Ramsay is not known for cooking Asian I food. I wouldn't have thought so, no. I think he cooks all kinds of types of food. So I'm sure that he does have a restaurant in London which does serve Asian food. But uh, Gordon Ramsay, and I counted them, has got 53 restaurants Crikey. listed on his website. And they serve a, a, a wide variety of yeah. ty types of cuisine. There's French fine dining. There's rustic English food. There's burgers, pizza, Asian food... And and more. Uh, but what's Gordon Ramsay known for cooking? Do you know? Have you ever seen his TV shows? No, and stuff? I tend to avoid them because I'm not very keen on him. He's far too bombastic. And aggressive and sweary. Mm, yeah. Lots of swearing. And but the fact is that um, no, of course English people are good at cooking. But I think maybe what you mean is they don't have a very recognisable national cuisine, which I suppose is true. Although if you go back into the Victorian and earlier eras of England, you'll see that they do have very hearty meat and two potatoes and pies and puddings kind of cooking. Elizabethan, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's very difficult to define British food and British cuisine. But there are lots of very, very fine cooks and chefs in England who cook. And they're particularly good because they cook cuisine from all over the world, just as you've demonstrated with Gordon Ramsay. They can cook Italian, French, Asian, you know, Middle Eastern, all kinds of different cuisines. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can have a, a fantastic meal of cuisine from anywhere in the world in England. Yep, 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 yep. There are 166 Michelin-starred restaurants mm. in the UK. Mm. Uh, let's see how many there are in France. It's probably more. Okay, 632. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <All laughs> well, right. it is a much bigger country, of course. How many are there in Paris? 119 in Paris. Uh, and in London, uh, 66. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. No. It's not a bad number. It isn't. It's not like we're bottom of the list or anything. Nope. As you say, yeah, we've got plenty of very, very good and very skillful cooks mm. who cook a wide variety of different mm. cuisines. Um, so there you go. It's Jay, Jay, don't believe the hype, all right? No. It's, it's, a, it's a myth and it's a stereotype that English food is bad. And it's a myth that's perpetuated by people who go to England expecting the cuisine to be the same shape as the cuisine in their country. Yeah. I mean, people from other countries where, for example, in France or Italy or wherever else, they have their own cuisine, which is very clearly defined, and they go to the UK and expect to see the same thing. UK cuisine, which is distinct from cuisine in other parts of the world, and is easy to to find in restaurants. But also what happens, and that's not the case, as my mum has said, that we have, you know, we, we cook well, but we cook, we include uh, dishes from other countries. And another thing that people, that happens is people go to the UK and they go to parts of London, the touristy areas, and they go to whatever, like Leicester Square mm. or some other touristy destination, and they eat the food in restaurants there. Mm. And that's not that's not the no. right food. That's that's bad food. There is definitely some bad food in England, of course there is, but there's bad food in France, and I'm sure there's bad food in Italy. Bad food anywhere. You just have to go to the right place, and there's some ex excellent food. Yeah. So with, with stereotypes, there's probably a little kernel of truth in there in some way. I'm just wondering if maybe it... It uh, harks back to the war, you know, the 1950s. If people came over to England in the 1950s, 
Yeah. They might have found it rather <laughs> disappointing in the way of food because we had rationing, very strict rationing for a long time after the war. And the food in the 1950s was very dull and boring because we, you know, we didn't have the ingredients to cook it. Yeah. To cook so, anything better. So probably in the early kind of period of globalization after World War II, mm. when suddenly we all learnt about each other's cultures a lot mm. more, um, you know, uh, in a lot more depth. Mm. Uh, the the first uh, things, the first impressions that people had of the UK and that were written into books and that, you know, that your parents' generation probably understood was that English food was dull and boring. Mm. But that's just maybe a consequence of the fact that World War II uh, stripped us of our, of our resources mm. and meant that every, most normal people didn't have access to all the different ingredients that you need like butter mm. just things simple mm. things like butter and sugar and were not widely available yeah. after world war ii because the country was uh, recovering from um you know um mm. the effects of world war ii so dennis's question are you ready for this mum yeah feel free to answer this quickly if you if you uh -huh. prefer but um what does she think about the war in ukraine <gasps> oh my god what a question <clears throat> It's horrendous, absolutely horrendous. We see it on the news here and it's just unbearable to look at. It's just appalling. The way, it, you know, it happens all the time. Whenever there's a war, it's one powerful man, usually, who decides he's going to do something and he does it and he just destroys ordinary people's lives. Ordinary people who are just going around their lives quite happily, living a normal life. And this man decides that he doesn't, he, he wants that country or he doesn't like the way they're doing things, just goes in and destroys it. It is absolutely heartbreaking. That's my answer. There you go, Dennis. OK, moving on to slightly something a bit more light. And um, uh, so moving on, Albie wrote this. Could, uh, could her tell us? No, <laughs> could she tell us? Could she tell us about some good memories about her childhood or teenage years? Anything come to mind quickly about your childhood or teenage years? You grew up in the 50s and the I 60s. I did. I was a child in the 50s. And, well, I remember when we lived in Stafford, just outside Stafford, that was a very happy time because we lived in a sort of, sort of semi-countryside and we used to go out and play, my brother and I, in the fields. Mm -hmm. For, you know, as long as I can... For a long time, we'd go out after breakfast and play and then wander back. We had such freedom to do what we wanted. We'd play in the field. There was Going through the field, there was a, a railway line and we used to stand and watch the trains. And sometimes we used to go on the railway line. These are the, the old-fashioned steam trains, are they? Uh, yes, they would have been. Yeah. Um, Choo-choo trains. Yeah. And uh, that's when my brother got start, started getting interested in steam trains. And they were fantastic things to watch. You know, if a train came along, you'd all stop and watch it because it was so impressive. And then there was a bridge under the railway line and that led to a canal. <laughs> seems so, would, <laughs> this just we, seems so dangerous. Absolutely. We would play on the edge of the canal. We'd make fishing rods and try and catch fish. I once jumped off the canal bridge as a dare and injured my wrist you know we just used to do all that kind of thing without any parents without any adults nearby we we strung a a big rope in in one of the trees and we used to swing on it uh, we used to climb trees my brother once fell out of a tree and landed on his back and obviously winded himself and you know was feeling absolutely dreadful i can remember him lying on the ground saying i've killed myself <laughs> <laughs> i've killed myself because he just couldn't couldn't breathe because he you know he'd winded himself so badly, so you know we used to do the most <laughs> things I would have been terrified at my, my children doing, but it was it was wonderful. We had a great sense of freedom. Oh, that sounds great. Mm. So Znad uh, wrote this. Um, Znad wrote this. Why is your son obsessed with Betels? <laughs> Probably because I... Well, well, what's what's Bettels? Beatles. Beatles. Why is He spelt it B-E-T-E-L-S. Uh, Beatles. B-E-A-T-L-E-S. -E -E -S. So not why is your son obsessed with Bettels, but why is your son obsessed with the Beatles? Probably because I was. 
You think that's the only reason it's not? No, but they, they were always in, you know, they were always referred to. The music was always in the house, right, from the moment you were born. Yeah. And you were able to talk to us about them. And, got, yeah, that's one of the reasons. I got indoctrinated at an early yes. age. Yes, and the other reason is because they're absolutely brilliant. Why wouldn't you be obsessed with the Bettles? <laughs> no, not the Bettles, <laughs> just Bettles. Bettles. Um, yeah, there you go. Mm. All right, Alex wrote this. Uh, after, why, after half a century... Doesn't the world? Hmm, why, after half a century, does the world still not understand the meaning of the song "Imagine"? Oh, well, imagine all because the people. it's a. Um, oh God, what's the word for it? It's it's an ideal. It's what the world should be like, but it seems that human beings aren't able to achieve the ideal that they when things are good they just destroy them that seems to be my experience the song is all about imagine there's there are no countries mm. uh, imagine no no borders no mm. barriers between each other mm. and so no reason to start mm. wars and start mm. fighting no mm. tribes mm. Uh, because a lot of the time the reason that we all fight each other is just because of a sort of um a, tr a sense of tribalism mm, of them, absolutely. them and us we are better than them exactly they yeah. are not us yeah they are other they are other and they are the baddies mm. and they are responsible for all the bad things that mm. are happening to us yeah and so them bad we kill them yeah. and then everything good no it's like the basic kind of monkey brain it's awful approach yeah and also another thing about the song is that imagine no religion mm. Uh, no one to kill or die for, mm. and he's Lenin is saying that it's essentially sort of um, the your, our God is bigger than your God. Uh, yeah. that, that but, you know, it's religion that causes those things. But then again, it's just another reason. I mean, if religion didn't exist, they'd find some other reason. Mm -hmm. Because not all lo lo wars are religious wars. They're about possession as he says imagine no possessions they're about possession of another land or possession of a coal mine or a you know it's just of a of a land a disputed yeah, yeah. piece of dirt on the yeah. ground that people uh, think they have a claim to yeah i mean what's the war in ukraine all about it's just because the russian leader decides he wants that piece of land so he's d he's prepared to destroy ordinary people's lives for the they, sake of it. They say it's a, cru you know, according to uh, the official Russian story, it's a crusade against fascism <laughs> <laughs> mm. in, in Ukraine. And, you know, the thing is that there's probably a little bit of truth in there. There probably is fascism in parts of Ukraine. Well, where there's, isn't there any fascism? fascism everywhere. fascism everywhere. Yeah. But does that is that an, a reason to blow up a shopping centre? No, full of course, innocent blowing people? up ordinary people and destroying ordinary people's lives doesn't get you anywhere. All right. Imagine no possessions. Imagine uh, there's no countries. Imagine no religion. Yeah. People seem to misunderstand that. John Lennon was interviewed in 1980 by David Sheff for Playboy magazine, and they talked about that. Mm. And John Lennon said this: "The World Church called me once." and asked me, can we use the lyrics to imagine and just change it to imagine one religion? <laughs> and Lennon think said... missed the point. Yeah. Lennon said, that showed me they didn't understand yeah. it at all. Yeah. It would defeat the whole purpose of the song yeah. and the whole idea. Yeah. So there, even there, there's one person sort of claiming, oh, can we have your song as well? Yeah. And also, it's not imagine one religion. There, no, there is no religion that's better than mm. the rest. It's imagine no religion. Yeah. Anyway, Christina again said um, this. Does your mum play any word games or any other games? Do you play like word games and stuff? Do you do any crosswords? Or uh, Yes. Uh, your father and I, most days, we have our little routines, you know. And when we sit down and have our lunch, we always do a crossword together. Oh, yeah. Which one? Um, well, it used to be the independent, but we now do the Guardian crossword. The, not the cryptic one. We're, we're no good at cryptic crosswords. We just do the, the concise one. Okay. Which, uh, yeah, we enjoy it. Do you do... Uh, you, you play Sudoku? I do Sudoku, but that's not a word game, is it? It's that's a game. Num yeah. game. I do Sudoku. I do the easy and the medium ones. I'm, I'm not very good at the hard ones because they annoy me. I can't be bothered to go to spend so much time on it um rick and i occasionally play scrabble which is a good game uh, although he always wins 
Um, you, you you do watch the you, you watch some TV quiz shows. We do. We you, love quiz shows. You watch University Challenge. Yes, in fact, I just noticed looking through the paper this morning that hooray, two of our favourite programmes are coming back on Monday. Uh, Only Connect, which is a very complicated sort of I don't know how you describe it. It's I don't know. I don't no, know the show. Logic kind of it's um, Victoria thing. Cohen, isn't it? Oh, yes, Victoria Cohen. It's the quiz master for that, quiz mistress. Um, and then it's followed by University Challenge. So, listeners, is- University Challenge is a bit of an institution on BBC TV. And it's um, basically a quiz show in which panels of students from different universities across the, across the country compete against each other uh, with academic questions. Mm. And the questions are really difficult, Mm. like really difficult questions and Mm. very specific questions about any academic subject. You know, you get questions about physics and chemistry and questions about uh, history and stuff like that. And uh, sometimes I will watch University Challenge with my mum and dad and I normally will get maybe one question (laughs) right. And mum and dad compete with each other as to who can get the most questions right. Now, according to dad, you normally win that. Well, there was a period when I used to get more than him. Uh, um, I think it's a bit more even now for some reason, probably because I'm losing my mind. <laughs> uh, um, but yes, I used to be better than him. I could. Um, but uh, the thing I find, I know the, the answer. Well, it's the same with Rick. We know the answer, but we can't say it quickly enough. We can't recall it. Yeah. That's the thing. That's the difficult thing. Because uh, we have to answer before the team's answer. That's one of the in annoying, order to get the point. That's one of those things, isn't it, about getting old that yeah. you know something, but yeah. just somehow the word does yeah. not materialise. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's great fun. We enjoy it very much. Okay. There you go. We also played Monopoly quite a lot this. Oh, hol- we have this holiday. Yeah. And guess who's won most of the time? No. Well, my wife. Yeah. No, you. No, I won once. My wife has won twice. You've won twice. No, I have not won twice. Okay. I think. No, no. It looked like the last time we played, it looked like I was going to win. Yeah. And then I didn't win because Uh, my wife came. Oh, that's right. I remember. She came through right at the end. Yeah. And and destroyed everybody. She destroyed us all because she claimed the dark blue squares and managed to build four houses on Mayfair. Didn't she get hotels on them? Uh, She got a hotel on Park Lane. Uh Yeah. Uh, which I think is about one thousand nine hundred yeah. pounds, <laughs> and also she got four houses on Mayfair. Yeah, she spread the investment across yeah. the two properties. Yeah. Four houses on Mayfair sets you back one thousand seven hundred pounds. Yeah, I think I landed. Well, I did. I yeah. got the card. Go straight to Mayfair. Exactly. There's a community chest. I yeah. think that takes you straight to Mayfair. So that destroyed me. I had. Um, anyway, never mind. Yeah. We. That's another story for another time. I'd love mm. to do a whole episode just about Monopoly. It's. A fascinating game, mm. if you think about it. Uh, Ray de Salsicha de Chicago, fantastic name, mm. s- Ask this. Ask her about the horse story. So, And he's saying that you and James, meaning James and mm. I, told us once on the podcast that you fell off a horse oh, yeah. when you were a kid. No, not when you were a no. kid. Um, no, it was you- when we were on holiday in the Pyrenees. When you two were kids, you were quite little. I think you maybe you were about four or five. Uh huh. And we went to what's the name of the place where we went? That little village up in the mountains, Walled Village, Collier. No, not Collier. Um, I don't remember the name of the place. Castle New. Castle New in the south of France. And they had southwest. Yeah, and they had some horses there that you could ride, for some reason or other. You know. Pony rides, very short ones. Yeah. And uh, so I decided I'd have a ride because I used to love riding when I was younger. Got on this horse and started walking away and I was wearing a big red sun hat and it was irritating me. So I put my arm up to take this hat off and the horse must have seen the big red sun hat out of the corner of its eye and it just flipped and started bucking and well you saw what it did I, I don't d- remember I was I'm, uh, I was too small yeah. at the time I anyway don't it it threw me off eventually although I managed to slide off the back rather than be thrown and um, that was it really I was okay just a bit shocked but uh, Luke was absolutely to use one of your daughter's words, you were traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> is that my, that's one of my daughter's words, is it? It is, Traumatized. Yeah, yes. yeah she has uh, learned that, the mm. word traumatized. She's got scared, mm. but then she's got traumatized, yeah. which she's learned means that when you're scared about something, but then you're still scared Sometime later, on, yeah. later on. Yes. So 
it's weird when you're a kid, the things that traumatise you. Yes. Obviously, seeing your mother getting thrown, thrown off, off a horse is quite traumatic. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, my daughter has been traumatised by it. So we were on holiday uh, in France um, a couple of weeks ago at the beach. And one of her friends, uh, a boy who's uh, about three years older than her, um, they were all putting sand in their, in their swimming trunks. <laughs> And so uh, my daughter put sand in his swimming trunks oh. and he, he was standing there with his swimming trunks all bulging oh. full of sand. <laughs> and apparently this traumatized her. And she sometimes says to me, oh, I've got this image in my head of uh, Leonard with his swimming shorts full of sand oh. and it's traumatized me. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that odd? That it's that's very odd. Sometimes like a weird thing, like, yeah. a, like, like, yeah. like the swimming shorts bulging with sand yes. and sand coming out of the edges. Yeah. That's the sort of thing as a kid that yes. can... It just looks weird it just and horrible looks all and wrong. unreal. Yeah. Like maybe the textures are all wrong yeah. and there's yeah. just something creepy about it. Yeah. So that's traumatised her. Right. Uh, but so I was traumatised, was I? Yes. Well, I don't know. You were, you were very upset and you were crying uh, about your mummy. All I remember of this is that I was crying. I don't yeah. remember seeing you come no, off the back of the horse. No. Um, yes. But so when you fell off, mm. you fell onto your bum, did you? Well, I don't really remember. It. Or the way I remember it is that I managed to, when it went up, when its front feet went up, I managed to slide off the back of the horse. You didn't, um, um, yeah. Rather than be thrown off sideways or over its head. Because that can be the dangerous thing if you land badly and yes, land on your back yeah, or yeah. your head. Uh, but but you, I didn't land on anything important. I think, I don't know, Luke, I don't really remember. You must I have just, slid off, I must and, have slid kind off and, of and sat on the ground. Presumably, yeah. yeah. But I didn't do myself any real damage, you thank God. You weren't scared uh, being faced with the back end of a horse. I mean, I don't mean that the bum is looked no. weird, but just that they <laughs> can kick. It might kick me. Obviously, I must have got up and run away quick. I don't know, Luke, I don't yeah. remember it in detail. Okay. But it didn't put me off riding because we went, uh, when we went on holiday to Ireland many years after that. With our friends, we uh, went on a horse ride. But the worst thing about that was the next day when we were all so stiff and achy, we could hardly sit down, all of us. It was really funny. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Okay. Oh, I can oh, hear. oh, everyone's back. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think that's probably going to be the end of the yeah, episode. It sounds Mom. like it, doesn't it? Um, so there you go. Thank you so much for answering the questions. Okay. Well, thank you to all your listeners for sending such interesting questions. Just want to be clear that, uh, yeah, so everyone else was out uh, at the market yeah. while we were recording this. Uh, well, my wife and our daughter went out to the market and dad has been sitting in his office listening to the cricket. Yes, that's right. Listening <laughs> to the cricket. It's England versus South Africa. Uh, it's a test match and it's apparently really interesting but yeah that's right he listens to the cricket and if you thought listeners that watching cricket was confusing and boring try listening to it well that's how we always used to do it when i was a child i can remember it reminds me of summer the sound of cricket commentary on the radio me too and listeners uh, it is wonderful it's a wonderful thing listening to a game of cricket you listen mm. to the commentary uh, the the you know the the way that the game is described in words it's a wonderful thing, uh, but so my wife and uh, my daughter are now back, so I think it's probably time to stop. Uh, if if the little one comes in, I will let her speak on the podcast for a moment, but uh, there's no guarantee that she's going to come in. I think she's probably gone straight to her granddad. She's probably gone straight to her granddad who and. They are now listening to the cricket together. Okay, well, yeah, so okay. you were saying, um, what, thanks for sending in questions? Yes, thank you for all the interesting questions. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for taking your time, Mum, to answer those questions. And I sincerely hope that the listeners have appreciated um, the fact you've taken your time to do it and that you, you know, uh, sincerely answered them. Uh, very nice indeed. Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Let, that's we have, it then. Let's have lunch. Yes. Oh, yes, I'm hungry. Me too. Well then, listeners, that was my mum in her own episode again. But hold on, we're not done yet. There's more. That's right. As you just heard at the end, my wife and daughter just came back from the market. So we thought we should stop recording and get ready to have lunch with everyone. We assumed that my daughter would hang out with her granddad in order to listen to the cricket with him, and you would, wouldn't you? Why not get your own personal Rick Thompson report 
with all the sports and everything. That's you, you would, wouldn't you? That's what we thought she was doing. But then she did come into the garden and she picked up the microphone. So here is a little interview with my daughter. So you get three generations of the family in one episode, a cross-generational podcast for you this time. So I asked my daughter to describe what she'd done at the market with her mum. And before I managed to press record on my recorder, she started talking about how they'd gone into the local museum in the town square. Now, this is just context, just to help you understand the conversation you're about to hear. So they went into the local museum in the town square. And in that museum, they have various items, including a large stuffed bear. And that's a a real bear stuffed. It's quite odd uh, and quite alarming when you first see it, because there's this huge bear on its hind legs. It's quite weird and quite interesting. So they've got the bear and lots of other things. And I asked her if she found the bear frightening or if she'd been traumatised by the bear, because it is a bit scary. And then I asked her about the word traumatised and she ended up describing how she'd been traumatised by a loud automatic hand dryer in a public toilet once. You know those hand dryers which you get on the wall in public toilets. You've just washed your hands. I hope you washed your hands after you've been to the toilet. So you've just washed your hands and then you put your hands in a dryer and some of them are extremely loud. Like that. So she was traumatised by one of those and uh, that is where we, this, that, and that is where this 10 minute clip begins with my daughter explaining how she got traumatised by uh, an automatic hand dryer. Okay, so here we go with a bonus bit of chat with the youngest member of the Thompson family. And by the way, she is four years old. She's four. Okay. You know the word traumatised? Yes. You use that word sometimes. Yes. Can you tell me about something that's traumatised you? When I was baby, I was traumatised because um, you had a hand. A what? There. A A hand? No, a hand dry. Oh, yeah, a hand dryer. Yes. In it, uh, Where was the hand dryer? Careful. Uh, um, it was uh, in the station. In the toilet? Yeah. It was in the airport, actually. Yeah. Yeah, you, that's right. You were tra- you've been traumatised by a hand dryer. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? Do you remember? No. You were a baby and we were in the airport. We were going to fly to to England and uh, it was just you and me and we went into the toilet, didn't we? Oh, yeah. And in the toilet there was a a hand dryer on the wall. Yes. Right? And we were, it was a bit stressful because we were in a rush to get our plane. We went into the toilet and and, um, by accident we activated the hand dryer. It was like oh. an automatic one, and it was a really powerful one, and it made a big noise, whoosh, like that, didn't it? I, yeah. And also, you know what else scared you at that moment? No. The, when that happened, I think we both jumped, you know, with the way you jump when you're surprised. <laughs> <laughs> we sort of, <laughs> like that. And the lid of the toilet fell closed, slam. The, the toilet seat fell down and went and made a big loud crashing noise like that so not only did we get surprised by the hand dryer we got surprised by the sound of the toilet seat going as well and the double effect of it was kind of quite a shock so are you still traumatized by um by the hand dryer yeah really how do you feel just talking about it well, not very scary. It what? Not very scary. No. Okay, but so how do you feel now when you go into a toilet in a station or in a in a restaurant or something? I don't remember. You don't remember. Yesterday we had dinner in a restaurant. Yes. And I went to the toilet, and you you followed me because you mm. needed a pee pee. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then we went into the. Don't press that button. Don't press that button, because if you press that button, the microphone will stop working. Don't press any buttons. Um, and we went to the bathroom and you and you were like, uh, you were a bit nervous. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, I'm scared about the hand dryer. But hmm? do you, was there a hand dryer in the toilet? No. No, there was, there were paper towels. So it was okay. 
So what else, what else did you do at the market? You saw a bear, and but you weren't scared. What kind of bear? Tell us about the bear. Well, it's the same bear we, we did see in the, in the museum. Ah, that bear. Yes. There's a big stuffed bear in the museum. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Did you see anything else in the museum? The bees. You saw the bees? Yes. What, what were the bees doing? Mm, collecting honey and some going back in their home. Ah, really? And we did see um, uh, the thing like with the mouse up and and the things. What? Mouse. You know the, the thing there who was yeah. um, moving? and. Yeah. One time we, I wanted to do that, and and mommy said to no. Ah, is it a game? Uh, no, just for seeing. Ah, okay, I don't remember what that is. A mouse that comes up. Yeah, go on. Gr- Granny wants to say something. What is it? Is it the the thing with the, with the box with the um the the elk, the antelope, and the bear? Yes. And the mouse comes up and they try to catch it, do they? Yes. Yes. It's a sort of toy thing. You have to put some money in and, it, and it's an animation. And it, Oh, uh, I know. I know. It's a little animation that teaches you about yeah. animals that used to live in this area many years yeah. ago. And the first time we did it, you were scared of it. Do you remember? Yeah. Ah, you're not scared of it anymore? No. Ah, you're growing up to be very confident and not scared by anything, right? Yeah. Yes, okay. Did you do anything else when you went out? Mm, we did some shopping. Okay. Did you buy anything for me? Um, no. No? Why not? Well, well she didn't think about something <laughs> for you. It's all right. I don't mind. Did, what did you buy then? Can you tell us? We bought nothing. You bought nothing? Yes. What about the postcards? Oh, uh, I didn't see her buying them. No, but you, you, did you write postcards? Yes, I just write them um, Josephine's po- postcard. Yeah, really? Okay, yeah. and did you send them? Did you put them in the letterbox? Yes. In the postbox? Yes. Okay, nice. Yeah. It is, what is that, a snake? No. It's not, it's the cable from that microphone. Yeah. It's moving because you've got your foot on it. i tell you what, though. We saw a snake, didn't we, the other day? Yeah. We, um, what, can you tell us about it? Um, we did see it in, um, the water. We saw it in the water? Yeah. That's right, we were on a pedlo on the river. Um, the unicorn one. That's right, the unicorn one, yeah. We were going along on the pedlo, it's a unicorn pedlo. Yes. A pedlo is, it's like a boat, but it's got pedals. Yes. And you pedal it, and it's sort of, there are paddles underneath that push yeah. you along. And this one had a big unicorn head with a rainbow on it. And yeah. we were pedaling along, along the river, and then uh, there at the river bank, we saw a snake in, in the water. Yeah. Um, it's a grass snake. That's right. There are two types of snake in this country, grass snakes and adders. Don't do that because it makes a noise. Uh, grass snakes and adders. And the adders are poisonous, but they are not very dangerous. No. And grass snakes are not poisonous, so they're not dangerous. They're nice snakes. And we saw it was quite a big one, quite a cute one. That's a half like... Mm, go on. Half like that. Um... Yeah, it's about that big. <gasps> yeah. Okay. A tiny bit bigger than that. Yeah. Question for you. What is the, your favourite food that Granny cooks? Pasta. Yeah, but sweet things. Uh, cakes. Cakes, yeah. Or maybe a... Pie. Yeah. Bagel tart. Bagel tart, yeah. Bagel tart. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We haven't had any bagel tart this bagel year. Bagel tart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Because <laughs> that is that the best thing that Granny does? Yes. Is it what? And, and pies and cakes and ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> I don't make ice cream. Granny doesn't make ice cream. She Not just buys time. it. I might make ice cream one time. Tell you who does make ice cream. Your mummy makes ice cream. She you. makes banana ice cream out of frozen banana and coconut yogurt. And it's really good. Don't hold it there. Hold it there, please. Why? Because you can break the cable if you hold it there. Okay. Yeah. Bakewell tart. Okay. What's a bakewell tart like? What is it? Um, I don't. Oh, with nuts. It's got an almond on the top. Yes. Yeah, and jam. Yes. 
And they're delicious and yummy. And yeah. yeah they they're are. super yummy. Yeah. And we can say big old dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Big old dad. All right. That's enough now. Thanks for talking to me. Do you want to say anything to the people of the world? Uh, Le- yes, I do. Oh, you're ha- handing the microphone to Granny. Oh, you're handing the microphone to me, are you? Yes. What are you wanting me to say? Well, I don't know. <laughs> So shall we say goodbye to the people of the world? She wants... No, you've got to say goodbye, then I'll give you the headphones. Goodbye. Okay, and thank you for listening, everybody. Can I have this? You want the the headphones? For just to listen. Okay, I'll give you the headphones so you can just listen to the sound of your voice through the headphones, and then that'll be the end of it. Oh, no, the headphones broke. Hold on. (laughs) Oh, God. You know how to do it again? I know how to fix it. Don't worry. I'm Luke from Luke's English Podcast. <laughs> oh, no. Cheap headphones that I bought for Grandad. So they, oh, 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 oh they're broken. The headphones are broken. Well, anyway, never mind. That's the end of the podcast. You're giving me that look of like, no, please, no. <laughs> You're giving me that sad look. Are you going to start crying? That's not a good way to end this, the episode. Look, they're, broken, they're actually broken. It's snapped. The plastic is snapped. <laughs> the, what Granny can do is hold the pads over your ears at the end of the episode here, just so you can hear the sound of your voice through the headphones. There you go. This is what it sounds like. You can speak now if you want to hear your voice. Yes, please. Hold the microphone. To say. Hold the microphone close. You're talking to all of the Lepsters in Lepland. You have a message for them. Okay. What what advice do you have to give them about about their life? About what's what's a good message for the world? What should everyone do every day? Um, what? Well, Granny says that they should not fight. They should not fight. Say. You should love each other. You should love each other. Yeah. Anything else? Um. Yes. What? You have to love the world. Yeah, that's right. And uh, be excellent to each other. Can you say that? (laughs) And party on. And party on. Okay, and say this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. To Luke's English Podcast. To Luke English Podcast. To sign up to LEP Premium on ACAST Plus. I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's alright, you don't have to do that bit. Uh, okay, wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. So there you go, listeners. A bit of wisdom there. From the voice of the future. Don't fight. You have to love each other. You have to love the world. The world, to be fair. Be excellent to each other and party on. And sign up to Luke's English Podcast Premium on Acast Plus for ad-free content. And of course, many, many extra episodes in which I help you with your vocabulary, grammar and pronunciation. To be fair, my daughter didn't say that. Uh, But I will train her to be able to say that. Um, Well then, I hope you agree, listeners, that that was a real treat. I mean, the whole thing, especially if you listened all the way to the end. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed doing this episode, being able to ask my mum those questions and get her responses while sitting in the very nice surroundings of her garden. And I hope you enjoyed it too. I must say... I love making these recordings in order to publish them for you, for your listening pleasure and for your English listening practice, hopefully both. Hopefully it's enjoyable and useful. I love doing this, but also I like making these recordings just as a record of family life, the voices of my family and my friends, stories, thoughts, memories, opinions and so on. It's nice. I'm lucky. And I'm very grateful to my mum for this episode and generally for all my guests who contribute so much to the podcast. 
Send us your comments, listeners. It's nice to read them and to get some human responses to our words. Sorry if you weren't able to send in a question. You might have thought, ah, oh, I wish I'd known about this. I would have sent a question that you might be thinking. I put up the request for questions on Twitter without much notice. I do that sometimes in order to get opinions or podcast questions from my audience. I might suddenly just put up a tweet saying, send me your questions about this. Um, so follow me on Twitter. If you want to follow me on Twitter, please go ahead, at English Podcast. That's my Twitter handle, at English Podcast. I'm also on Instagram, but I hardly ever use it. I'm on Facebook as well, Luke's English Podcast on Facebook. Um, I generally don't go on Facebook very much anymore, but I am there. Uh, and also I am on Instagram, but I don't use Instagram at all, really. In fact, at the moment, I only use Instagram to help me book and promote stand-up comedy shows because some of the comedy nights in Paris use Instagram to communicate with comedians. Uh, hold on, hold on. I'm now opening Instagram on my phone, just having a quick look at my profile just to see. So I've got so I've got 1,911 followers, uh, which is quite good considering I've only got one post. I've only ever posted something once and it was for a comedy show that I did when? Years ago, I think. I don't even know when that was. That might have been pre-COVID times. So I'm sorry, I don't really use Instagram very much, but uh, maybe I should start using it more. But you can follow me on Instagram. You can follow that one post on Instagram at Luke's English, at Luke's English, L-U-K-E-S English, at Luke's English on Instagram. Okay. All right. So there you go. Thank you again, listeners, for listening and supporting the podcast. Do me a favor, if you don't mind, like and subscribe. Okay. Like and subscribe wherever you are listening to this. Uh, leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts. If you use Apple Podcasts, do me a favor and leave me a positive review. It really helps the show. Tell your friends about the podcast because there's nothing better than word of mouth. So tell your friends. And you could support the show by becoming a premium Lepster. And not bad, you also get all of the premium content too and no ads in episodes. Teacherluke.co.uk slash premium. If you want, you can just send a donation if you want to support the show. You can do that through PayPal on my website. You'll see a PayPal button. You can just click it. If you want to just like contribute something, just generally to help. Okay. Um, one other thing, I just noticed um, that Anthony Rotuno, who I've had on a guest, uh, I, who I've had as a guest on this podcast a few times, he just uploaded an episode to his podcast, which is called Life and Life Only. Uh, episode thirty-three. It's called The Corporation, and that's with me. So, just in case you didn't have enough stuff with me to listen to, you could listen to that. It's a conversation with Anthony about. Um, a documentary from 2003, which is all about corporations and their role in everybody's lives. It's a sort of critical um, documentary about the corporation in society and in our lives. And so it's a full discussion about that, about the role of corporations in our lives. So if you want a bit of serious stuff, I think there's, there's a bit of humour in there too. But uh, you could check it out. Life and Life Only is the name of the podcast. Episode 33, The Corporation. Okay, just a heads up for those of you who would like to listen to that. Go ahead and do it. So, I will speak to you again soon. I have loads of episode ideas and so many things I want to record for the podcast. But I also don't want to overwhelm you with too many episodes. But anyway, I will be working as always, on producing new stuff, hopefully some diverse stuff, different things. But uh, there you go. I think it's time, though, probably to focus on some premium content now. So I'm going to get my head down and work on some premium stuff. But until next time, I will just say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.